Welcome to Origin Stories. I'm RD. I'm Parrot. We're telling stories behind the digital art revolution. Each week we interview top artists and live stream with the community. Let's go. Today is tomorrow's Origin Story. Story. Exulo, welcome to Origin Stories. Hey, happy to be here, man. Thank you. Of course. Long time coming. Been in a number of different places interacting together. Most recently, I believe it was on Vertical Crypto Arts platform. Um, shout out over there. But now you get yours. Nah, I appreciate it. No, really. I love what you guys have been doing. Like we were talking about before, just being able to bring people together, bring artists in here and tell their stories. It's, it's really beautiful. I think it's, it's much needed in this space because there's a huge amount of supply now and this onslaught of artists coming into the space. So it's really being able to highlight these artists. So yeah, I really appreciate your time and being on here. So yeah. Speaking of highlighting artists, let's, let's begin the highlight of you. The grand question, here we are. What is your origin story? Yeah, I, how far do you want to go back? Because I've been doing art all my life, dude. That right. is so. That is your choice. I want go with your passion today. You can go as far back as you want, but pick us up at a meaningful at a meaningful point in time. Could be the very the very first time you picked up something, or a little bit down that road. Yeah, I mean, I'm like a '90s kid, so I grew up. Um, I was kind of like a latchkey kid, so my parents would be off at work, and I'll come home after school with a key in hand and I'll go in to like an empty house. So I only had like access to like whatever was on the TV. I had to find ways to entertain myself. So it was either through the TV or dial up internet back then or like art. And I always kind of gravitate towards those two is kind of like getting my information, getting my inspiration from like the TV and like growing up with like Japanese anime, like Gits and Akira and Dragon Ball Z. So it was like being a kid, I absorbed a lot of that kind of entertainment. And then I started injecting into my artwork and getting really into the art scene there as like a young kid. And I started getting more recognition from like my art teacher and she saw that like I had something so she wanted to kind of push me in different directions and she got me into like advanced placement art back in like when I was in elementary school and being able to experiment with like fine art and I think I just there's something in me that just kind of clicked I think I was like in it had been like in sixth grade and I was like an advanced placement art and I just kind of knew that like I wanted to do this for like a living I wanted a career as an artist I didn't want to be anything else besides that. There's just something about it that I think when I was a kid, it was a way to kind of vocally kind of express myself and also escape and kind of build my own like internal world. So I just knew I, I just wanted to do something with it. And then fast forward to like early 2000s, my neighbor happened to have like an iMac, a Wicom tablet and a copy of Photoshop. And I came from mostly fine art. I didn't know anything about digital art, but it definitely was fascinating. And it had like, you can do so much more with it. So I just kind of ran with it. He would come over, yeah, I'd go over to his house and I, he would let me kind of play around with all these different tools. And then he would actually start commissioning me because he did uh, music too. So he would commission me to do like album art covers, and then any kind of artwork for the, uh, for his uh, art, you know, career at the time. So um yeah like that was kind of like where it was really starting off with and then after that I I think I pretty much went into uh visual effects at the time because I think everything that was happening around the early 2000s with like VFX technology and how it was kind of taking off and like I kind of knew that I think digital art and VFX art was going to be kind of that new wave and where things are going to kind of change in technology of merging with tech and art. So I knew I had to kind of go and take my career in that, that realm. So I went to school around 2007 in San Francisco, and I went to uh, Academy of Art to study visual effects and animation. Because around then it's just like, okay, like I want to work on a feature film or a video game, or this is like, this is what it means to be like a digital artist at the time. What Everyone, at that moment, just to date it, what would have been your, your number one dream, like, your number one dream job? Yeah, exactly. 
dream job. I remember like freaking out, like, oh man, like Prometheus when it came out, like Ridley Scott, like, cause as a kid, like in the nineties, it's like, that's, that's the kind of stuff I grew up on was like aliens and anything James Cameron touched. So yeah. anything they put out like Avatar and like Prometheus was like, man, like that would have been the dream project. But that was at the time. Yeah. Like that's, it was kind of my goal. And the mindset I had was like, these are kind of the big feature films I want to work on. And after school and after learning visual effects and all that stuff, I was able to land in uh, and work with the director, James Wan of uh, Saw, the whole Saw franchise mm -hmm. and Insidious. And we worked on his first Insidious film, super like low budget. It was like the budget was like $5 million or something like that. And I was able to jump on board with him and work on his film and being able to kind of like actually get my you know, feet wet and right out of like college and everything like that. So it was a really fun learning experience. And then that film like blew up and it was huge. And I think it did really well, like in the box office. So it was really cool being able to work on something that no one really knew much about. And it was kind of like an indie project. Might not have been the big blockbuster movie that like, I dreamed about doing, but it was still like something. And it felt something like it was special to be able to kind of interact and talk with the director and have like actual feedback and back and forth so that's like one of the reasons like i really fell into love with like vfx even though i had like a, a dream to be big blockbuster movie and like your name in the credits and like all this excitement and hype around it but you know like i eventually did get to work on blockbuster movies and it wasn't that fulfilling dream that i had in mind it wasn't like it was hard work. Mm -hmm. he, he felt kind of like a cog in the wheel and your voice wasn't really heard. And this, because the teams were so big, you got like hundreds of VFX artists working on one film as opposed to James Wan and Sidious. And it's like a handful of dudes working on this one film. So completely different experiences, but a lot mind. of times expectations right with a, yeah. a blockbuster it's like expectations are so high it's like i'm part of this insane experience oh my god yeah. then this other side i mean i guess hindsight is 2020 20, but when you were working with just that handful of dudes on a film where maybe the future was a bit more uncertain did you have a feeling then that it would be special or was that something that was realized upon release and after i mean when it comes to like yeah like indie films like you kind of know like when you talk with the director you talk with like the, the producers and people behind it they kind of give you a little bit of a rundown of what it it's going to be like because um you kind of have a gut feeling like okay this sounds really cool i jive with these other people these other artists these directors and the people that are behind it and you kind of go with your gut feeling on that and you, it goes to like how you feel like you're going to collab and how you're going to um, interact with these people do you guys you know are you guys influenced and inspired by the same things you guys jive on the same wavelength and then you just kind of know that it, it's going to be a great project whether or not how it's going to be successful and sometimes it's just about the the project itself the experience it might be a flop it might not be a great project in the end or get the hype that it deserves but still the experience is great and if it does do great then that's even amazing that's that's yeah. awesome like like i remember i was it was like 2015 i was working at a vfx house and they're like here's a project for you it's like winona Ryder's in it i'm like oh, okay cool winona Ryder, and it's like a horror show and it's called stranger things and this is before anyone knew like what stranger things was i'm like Okay, absolutely. I want to work on something that with Winona Ryder and horror, like Beetlejuice is like came to mind. So I'm like, okay, I'm down with that. I don't know what the hell it's about or if it's going to do well. And then got to work on Stranger Things and then boom, it blew up. And watching Amazing. that explode from like, no one knew what the hell it was. To, like, it's everywhere. It's really cool being able to like kind of watch that unfold. What a process. That's, that's an interesting one to have. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty wild. And like I said, uh, visual effects probably started for me like around like 2010. Mm -hmm. So this is like right during like, I was able to work like on Iron Man and all that stuff. So things were starting to really pick up and, and like 
things were like becoming more globalized and visual effects and VFX artists were and digital artists were starting to have to move around a lot to different locations because of tax incentives and the way budgeting works and it's cheaper to film and it's cheaper to do it here. And artists were getting really stretched thin and they're already like getting compounded with like long work hours, like 120, 100 work hour weeks is like not uncommon, especially on big blockbuster movies. So VFX artists at that time just didn't have enough time for the personal work and on personal growth and creativity. They're working on these projects 24 seven, you know, their mental state, their physical state is starting to suffer. And around then I just, my wife and I, cause I met my wife in, uh, in school and then she was kind of with me this whole time on my career. And we kind of made the conscious decision of like, we should just do remote work because in the VFX industry, you can definitely, you know, work on the big blockbuster movies, have a secure income and, but you're working these crazy hours mm -hmm. or you can be more independent, pick your clients, pick your hours, your remote based, but it's risky. You know, you don't have that security. And I think because I was already doing like art all my life and I was kind of like a self-taught in ways at a young age and kind of like a self-starter that was like, kind of made sense just to go remote and that was I was like full remote work working on you know indie films and big films and commercials so things were really working out as like a a uh, remote artist mm -hmm. and that allowed me to do my own creative art and to get back into what I kind of loved doing like as a kid as that kid in the 90s and drawing and illustrating and all these vibrant uh, colors I used to do, like when I was a kid, like that stuff was abandoned for like 10, 15 years because I was so involved in visual effects. So it wasn't until like 2015 that my wife and I decided, all right, let's make x -Fulo. Let's kind of go back to like those roots of why I like to make art in the first place. So, so how did that feel? Did it feel like the old uh, cliche that it'd feel like riding a bike and, and you picked it back up and you're already, you're rolling and you're loving it? Or did it take a minute and feel a little bit creaky and, and you had to re-embrace? A little creaky at first, but it was just like, it was so much fun. And that's kind of, I felt like kind of like a kid again. And you kind of had to drop that judgment on yourself, and not be so critical of yourself and just have fun with it and run with it. And that's really what kind of kept it going. So it was kind of weird at first, kind of cranky and like getting on this odd, dusty bike. But, you, you know, you oil those gears and you just get into the groove of it and you, you run with it. And, and then because of social media and having that response and that feedback mm -hmm. um, was super helpful in the beginning stages. So, but Honestly, it's kudos to my wife. I don't know, if, like I said it before, if Exula would have been even around if she was the one that nudged me because she was so familiar with like all my artwork growing up as a kid. She's like, why don't you just draw the stuff that you used to do? Like, it's so wild and so crazy. And like, she knew. yeah, yeah. She kind of just instinctually knew and I just trusted her. So I was just like, yeah, you're right. And then it just kind of took off. So things started kind of splitting between this VFX digital art film stuff to like this Exulo persona and creating these like crazy weird, you know, surreal cyberpunk kind of themed artworks that was really inspired by the stuff I grew up with. So two, two questions. So when you first got back on the creaky bike before you oiled the gears, do you remember the very first thing you attempted to create that you did create? And then second question, when you did, when the gears were oiled and you were really, really rolling, do you remember the first artwork where you said, oh yeah, that, like I, I have it. Like th this, this feels right. This feels special. Yeah. I mean, it probably was around like 2013, 14. And I was just kind of going back on a lot of the books I used to have growing up, like I, like uh, Mobius and mm -hmm. MC Asher and just kind of looking back on some in like some of the pop like the surrealist um, artwork and just uh, some of the stuff I grew up with so 
I was starting to get really back into that and inspired. And I remember doing this uh, pen and ink with like Copic pen on moleskin and um, just like doing like kind of a doodle and a drawing. And it felt kind of like, it's kind of real surreal and vivid colors I usually use. And then it felt kind of like this Mobius vibe. So my early stuff was like, had this definitely like Mobius feel to it. And I just remember having like the funnest time and it was just total experimental and just playing around and being loose and creative. And like, that's when I was kind of like really kind of feeling a little more confident about it. And then I think it wasn't until that I just started like putting stuff up on like Instagram and seeing that people were really engaged with it and it really resonated with people. And it started feeling like there was a dialogue and a back and forth with me and my audience and the conversation we can start. And that's when it started clicking like, okay, this is like, people actually resonate with this stuff and people click with it. And I think th this makes sense. This, this is something that I want to keep pushing. And it just kind of took off from there, you know? All right, let's take Instagram. So the first post that you have listed now, I don't know if that's your first true post or whether it, it, it was like, if you deleted posts before it, it, I can never tell which is which, but March 13th, 2016, and it's Primate VR Experience. That was, uh, yeah, not even like a year or two. I made that afterwards. And yeah, I remember making the Primate VR because I would watch these podcasts and get introduced by Bitcoin and what cryptocurrency was that was like back in like 2013 mm -hmm. and I was already starting to absorb like what crypto is I remember even telling like my tax guy my like fiat's bullshit and crypto is gonna take <laughs> over this is like years ago and looking back so weird to see that that it's blown up like that but yeah I think I was just so inspired by at that time making that piece and that was around like 2015 that the primate VR and I didn't post it up until like a year later that like I wanted to do something about technology because I think growing up in like the 90s and the Japanese anime and like I think I was already instinctually really into tech mm -hmm. and being able to fuse that because that's kind of a reflection of like visual effects is VFX is a, a mixture of like technology and art mm -hmm. and I think that's what Exula was really starting to kind of form into is reflection of like this future almost dystopia and technology and i think i just imagine like bitcoins like kind of like the future of currency and in ways i think we we're still monkeys and we can still react and act as monkeys and do silly and stupid things because you know we're all flawed and human at the end of the day so we have like kind of this you know unadvanced way of reacting to something that feels so advanced if that makes sense like yeah. crypto and tech feels so almost beyond what we can kind of comprehend in ways and our reaction towards it is kind of like this a monkey so this like monkey bitcoin theme was starting to kind of brew and yeah it was a really kind of it's one of those pieces i look back and it to me like it felt kind of timeless mm -hmm. but that's my personal take on it yeah, and, and it's it's popped up in your work in the yeah. NFT space. I guess we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> um, so take us forward then. So is that the true first post on your Instagram that that's what launched it and you plowed forward from there? Yeah, that was, uh, I, I think I was maybe tinkering around with like some 3D stuff, but not like real hardcore. But that was like my first big, yeah, post. That was mm -hmm. when I was like, all right, set in stone. This is where it's going to go. This is the style, this is the aesthetics, this mm -hmm. is the themes I kind of want to play on and took it from there. So yeah, when I look back, it's always to that image. And keep walking us forward. Take us the, the milestones that today in 2021 come to mind, you know, bridging the gap from, I guess, 16 through the NFT space, but but still prior. What, what milestones come to mind, whether they be artworks, themes, wherever you want to go? Um, yeah, it's like, you know, with Instagram, things were just starting, things were pretty good around 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. um, I started meeting up with the other artists online. There was Slime Sunday. We were following each other at an early stage. Mad Dog Jones was there. And then like Buck Render and Victor, all these guys. And I think we just kind of met in this virtual space because we all kind of jived aesthetically and were inspired by our own art, uh, each other's artwork. So mm -hmm. 
Um, being able to kind of meet virtually and see other artists grow too was a really awesome milestone because it felt like, all right, this is like bigger than just me. This whole digital, it felt kind of like this digital creative revolution. There's this creative energy. We're not in the same room together, but there's feels like this creative energy that people are starting to kind of push each other and push themselves. Mm -hmm. And it felt like a big like kind of milestone in, in digital art itself. Cause people to be able to kind of personally express themselves without having to work for a client and fulfill their dream, you're actually kind of fulfilling your own vision. So that felt like a huge stepping stone in the right direction creatively. And then you started getting recognition um, from like celebrities and, and big names and musicians and people in the music industry and in the film industry, like reaching out and wanting to cl collaborate. And when you see kind of like, all right, now I can start kind of making money with my art itself, you know, outside of the visual effects. So I'm going to run with it. You kind of know that it's going in the direction you kind of want, you kind of go with the flow of things is, you know, you can't always predict where things may land. So you see these little hints in the road and you're like, you kind of run with it. So big milestones is seeing other artists grow with you in this kind of community of artists come together. And then the other ones is you're starting to get recognized like globally and internationally because of these social media platforms. So that's kind of like, and it allowed, you know, further exploration, you know, now, now you make an income and now you have some free time and you have people that kind of believe in you. And for me in ways, if like people believe in me and I believe in myself, I mean, it kind of a back and forth. So you just kind of keep growing, keep pushing. Mm -hmm. But even with those like great, great things that happen in life, there's always like drawbacks and uh, people's engagements were starting to go down on Instagram around like seven, 2017, 2018. And people were feeling very discouraged and kind of down on themselves that they're not getting the same kind of recognition, the same kind of dopamine effect that you get from like hundreds, thousands to tens of thousands of likes and engagement on your work. And people will start, you start questioning yourself, like, is it, is it me? And then you realize, oh, it's the algorithm and mm -hmm. it's all these other things. I remember like talking with Slime Sunday, like, I think like a couple of years ago, I know the exact same feeling where he's just like, I don't know, man. Like, I think I might just quit. Like I remember seeing like a post from slime Sunday, like a couple of years ago, he's opening up his own like store and he's just like, I, and he was having the hardest time because of censorship. Mm -hmm. And I was dealing with the same thing at that time too. And, and I could tell that he felt like stuck. Everything felt like it felt like this build up, and then everything kind of just got locked and felt like stuck and nowhere to go. And it's just like these social media platforms aren't very helpful. You don't get the kind of engagement and growth mm -hmm. that you're looking to kind of build yourself and your brand up in a way. So people felt very stuck and locked. And I think the NFT stuff just kind of fractured it and broke it apart. And people kind of felt like they couldn't come up and like breathe and mm -hmm. be recognized. So. It's a very interesting thing. So how, how did how did one thing lead to another? So from that locked and stuck phase that NFTs first crossed your radar to take a look over and then ultimately jump over into? I mean, it was thanks to Slime Sunday, 100%, you know, and that was the beauty of it, where it's just like seeing him like in like kind of a, a stuck spot. And then all of a sudden it's like he he's like doing really well for himself and he's doing these amazing collaborations. So and being able to be like recognized and like know like uh, the authenticity of it and the ownership elements of it and a lot of this language that was used in like late mid two uh, 2020s that you started hearing people talk about because digital art theft was very common on the social media platforms people taking artists work and never tagging them big celebrities with millions of followers they'll take their artwork cool artwork and it's very popular and put it up won't tag the artist artist gets pissed and it's just like you know how am I supposed to grow from this when when this is happening and then you hear about nfts and the authenticity of it and the ownership of it and actual ledger and saying this is the source and this is mm -hmm. where it came from and I think it clicked with a lot of people 
especially people coming from like the Instagram space. So that's pretty much was the, 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 the changing point for me to decide to jump into the NFT spaces, those two things. And then you realize, oh shit, you can actually make a living off of it mm-hmm. and a crazy amount of living. And it's, just, it's, it's nuts. And um, I think the, the excitement's there and I think it's still there and, you know, there's going to be ups and downs and we're definitely experiencing that. So mm-hmm. it's a wild ride. A wild ride indeed. Yeah. I mean, I feel like looking back, digital ownership was just being screamed for like the opportunity, the opportunity to have just that, that simple authentication of ownership. Like you said, tying it back to the original source. Um, Just thinking about all the years that went by without really having that, or I, I know NFTs have been around now for several years, but they certainly weren't even close to popularized up until late stages 2020 um and it just feels like a, a gap that i don't know how it existed for as long as it did but now we're here yeah yeah and in mad respects and props to those people coldy like x copy and mm-hmm. sarah show and uh, doing their vhs artwork and i'm sure there's a few a ton of others but those were the people that uh, were there like boots on the ground and building up you know getting their hands dirty and before anyone was paying attention. And I think that was like, what, 2017, 18. Yep. And prior is like Pepe. I think I remember hearing about Pepe, the frog, and all that stuff. And then Crypto Kitties. Mm-hmm. And then it was these guys with the NFTs and Super Rare. And, you know, I bet that's pretty fascinating to watch where it's like, oh, cool. Made a hundred bucks on, on my NFT. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. And all of a sudden it just blows up. You're like, holy shit, I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I always say standing on the shoulders of giants. So huge yeah. shout out to all those that you named and a lot and a lot more too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, th- those people are important people in the space and always being able, that's the beauty of, of even the artifacts project is, you know, history and being able to tell that story. It's a, it's a fun story to just get educated on, just look back and chart the course and have so many different conversations to understand. Yeah. What were those early stages and how did, what were the mid stages and now here we are. And, um, yeah, T- tie that thread. But, uh, but getting back to you, my friend, getting back to you. So you, so Slime Sunday, you, you take a look over and you see goes from stuck and all of a sudden he's rolling and you make your decision. I mean, you it sounds like you were on crypto fairly early. So you, you understand the value there, all these dots connect in your mind. How do you decide what that artwork is that you Exulo are bringing into the NFT space? And then where are you putting it? Uh, I mean, I mean, it was all started with Super Rare. Yeah. And this is back, like, reached out to Super Rare, um, emailed them. This is back in, like, November, in October, actually, when it was, you can actually email and hear a response back and get yeah. on board. So, yeah, yeah I feel, see, you probably heard this a lot, just super fortunate to be able to, to be at that those early stages and to be able to jump on board there. And, um, you know, like I wanted to make something that people knew me for it, for the style that people were able to resonate with me. So I played a lot with the same themes. It's going to be an illustrative piece. It's going to be something that people are familiar with and, and know my style for. And I, yeah, I remember sat down. I didn't even think I was going to, I didn't even know what I was going to do. I just thought, oh, maybe I'll do one of my older pieces that people really like. Maybe the, the primate one I did years ago. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do, but made a piece that was kind of like this visceral, it was like the Nino Zanny piece of the kids mm-hmm. shredded apart and all these pills flying everywhere. It was one of those pieces where you kind of draw it and you don't know what it's going to be or what it means. And it kind of comes from a visceral raw place. So you just kind of throw it together and bash it, do the whole ex style that people recognize me for and just have fun with it. And when I was making it, I didn't think I was going to make it as an NFT, but when it was completed, it just felt very special and a, a, a great way to reflect in, in a good Genesis piece. So I thought, mm-hmm. okay, that's going to be the piece. So I just threw it up there and ran with that. And like, you know, things were starting to kind of pick up. So it was fun being able to, at that time, being able to see the reaction people were getting and then seeing, like, I was, like, talking with, like, Mike Beeple before, like, some of his drops and the excitement and the energy that he was having with, like, what was going to be happening with them and seeing everyone's, like, lives change and 
this momentum and this like friction it was this like real raw creative energy that you just kind of kept going you start pushing myself i said started doing animations and like face face cap stuff with like the monkey and reacting like recording my face and putting it in 3d and putting vr goggles on it and just playing with it like i felt like a kid again it goes back to like yeah that kid playing with like crayons or drawing at a young age and you just you know you just made fun art you thought it was funny or weird or like surreal and you just challenged yourself and you keep pushing it and i think to me like those early stages that's what it was all about it was just kind of just pushing myself in there these this early years so let me let me pause nfts there for a second to ask a question that i, I want to make sure to ask you referenced it as the the general exulo style that everyone knows me for right yeah when I see that, I see some, some of the different themes that you've talked about, but also these colors, right? Where does that all come from? Where, where, where does your color palette, which is so special to yeah. you, where does that come from? Um, I'm in multiple places, but I, my first memory that always comes to mind is I remember being like 11 years old and I like drew my hand and then with like pencil and then I just filled up the entire hand with like these psychedelic colors and these swirly lines and like these pinks and blues and greens and and I think it was just kind of that feeling I got of like it's simply put it's like the colors made me feel happy it made me uh-huh. feel like alive and exhilarated and very uplifting so I think at a young age I was always kind of like drawn to colors for some reason mm-hmm. just tapped into that ether and I don't know where it came from it's like it feels like it's in my blood that I think when I walked what inspires me to as an artist like even growing up like Mobius stuff I thought was just so rich in color and and like I grew up like in northern California so I was around a lot of hippies and the psychedelia kind of like the themes that you see in art so I was very familiar with like Alex Gray mm-hmm. as a kid and I think I was inspired by it and just I loved creating stuff with colors, being able to show that. And when I was doing VFX for so long, like it was all photorealism, muted color tones, almost like no color at all. So there was probably like 10 years of my like career as an artist, I didn't really have much color going on. Mm -hmm. So that color stuff was like brewing inside me and then Exula just like bursted out. I mean, that's exactly motion, yeah. like this shredding body parts and the yeah. rich, vivid color tree. It's, it's just a reflection of how I feel, you know? You know what I realized there on the spot? I realized hearing you tell that story about yourself at 11 years old and finding those colors that made you happy. Like I can see that on you as you recount that. Yeah. And as I'm considering my own interaction with your artwork, I don't recall an Exulo piece that I've seen that I don't leave feeling uplifted in some manner or not certainly not feeling negative about it all. And yet when you read a line deeper, some of what is within the artwork, it does handle aspects of dystopia, some, uh, some difficult themes from time to time. Talk about that interplay between the, the happy, the happy colors, but then sometimes the dystopian or darker themes. Uh, it just kind of goes back to juxtaposition. And I think in art, like, thematically things can have like a balance and then life in general as a yin and yang and the, the balance of life there's always not everything's like positivity only like that's not a very always helpful rhetoric there's got to be like a balance between the dark and the light and and I think that that duality is what I, I really like to play on and I always loved like hearing clients I work with some like uh, other artists and clients that like your stuff so like weird and so like almost like gory and like hard to kind of like but I can't stop looking at it because of the colors and I think that's like a, the fun play on it the do du- the duality of light and darkness of of playful colorness and that was what's really great about colors it really draws people's eyes in you know people will only flip through on social media will pay attention for three seconds on an image and then keep going so the colors were able to captivate and get people's attention but then being able to kind of tell a little bit of a story or have some weird imagery in there it adds some layer and texture to the artwork and sometimes like for me it's about 
make, maybe making a piece that feels timeless, you know, people that can resonate with it. It, it feels that way to me. I mean, not only, I guess another word to throw in there is, is futuristic. You know, a lot of your pieces do feel out there, you know, that, that we'll get there, that we're going to, we're going to hit some of these um, approximate visuals at some point down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like, what's cool about like technology and digital arts, you know, with VR, mm -hmm. virtual experiences, and you hear everyone talk about the metaverse. And I think, yeah, like virtual VR uh, digital art installations are going to become a thing you know you mm -hmm. just don't go to uh, the MoMA and you have like this installation you can walk and interact with you know like people who want to be able to kind of put on like a, possibly a VR headset or AR and being able to walk around and experience like a, a live animated moving sculpture that people mm -hmm. might not have be able to experience like in the fine art world so and now you're starting to see the fine art world with technology and advancements mm -hmm. being affected with that. Like there's uh, fashion designers that are using like 3D printers and it's this fusion of, of like fine art, the old and the new and tech. And it's exciting to see where it might go. And the future is like in ways exciting, even though there's some scary things like ahead and, you know, there's the impact of global warming that people are really worried about. People were really worried about like finance and, you know, income stability and a living wage. And there's a lot of pushback and fear I think that people have, but we also have a lot of tech going on and a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. So it's, it feels kind of like at this crossroads, but you know, you can always just be hopeful in the end. Mm -hmm. But not too, right. The balance, as you, as yeah. you said, that juxtaposition. Yeah. Being realistic, you yeah. know? Um, yeah, speaking of, speaking of that blending, a lot of the experimentation going on just to, to date us a little bit here in our conversation today, something important that's going on is at, at Christie's, the trespassing sequence of auctions. What I find so fascinating about that is at least in my radar to, to, to a grander scale, it's the first time that some more traditional artists are being merged with a lot of current digital NFT artists that you know, we started where the auction houses were sort of marginalizing it a little bit, then they were featuring it, but it was the, the digitally native, you know, all digitally native, uh, proof of sovereignty, right? But all yeah. digital. And then now all of a sudden it's just this merger. And that to me is just another sign that we're headed in full scale adoption, more respect, fine art collectors dipping their toe at some point yeah. uh, down the road. Yeah, because we have a huge amount of like supply, but right now it's not enough demand. Mm -hmm. but being able to try and different things and Christie's feels kind of like this melting pot. Now it's like you got in the same room, fine artists and digital artists. Cause it always felt like a divide between the two. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember like in the early days, there's always like a, a line between you're either a fine artist or a digital artist. You're either mm -hmm. a digital photographer or you're a photographer. Mm -hmm. And that division doesn't help anyone. I think, there's some danger in tribalism and, and teaming up in teams and you're either this or either that. And it's just like playing around with the, cause at the end of the day, these are just tools, whether it's a fine art tool or it's a digital tool. So seeing what Chris is doing is, it's really great. You know, it's, it's, it feels like a melting pot. And I think that they're able to, you know, Sotheby's, all these guys being able to jump in at these early stages it helps legitimize it and push the, the fine art and the digital art and the one and one editions and because i love the, the avatar stuff and people going crazy on the you know crypto punks and that's its own like community and its yeah. own place and i think that feeds back into nft artists because people are going to be you know flipping those avatars and making you know some money off of that but some of them are going to inject it into into digital artists or they're going to hold it or it's, you know, they put it back into the community. So I think it, it feels like these two separate groups, you know, the avatars and the fine art and then the digital art one-on-one -on -one editions, but it all kind of connects in ways. Yeah. That def definitely has some, has some connecting pathways. Yeah. Um, take us around the room, take us around the, the, the backdrop here. I love, first of all, I love the lights, but there's also uh, at least four, no more, five pieces of art. I uh, would love, would love a tour. Yeah. Well, I got this little webcam. So I, the USB cable is only like 
Oh no, no, you can, you can, you can leave it. You can leave it there, but just take us, take us visually. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So, uh, I mean, that piece back there, right there, that guy oh, is, yeah. uh, it's on super rare. Yeah. And that's an actual physical painting. So some of these I actually create uh, digitally first, and then I project it onto a canvas and then paint it like acrylic on canvas. And that one is whammy. And uh, I think I sold that like a few months back. And then um, we got a couple other pieces and these pieces I was doing 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. So kind of right around that time when I was really like hitting hard, like on social mm -hmm. media. And that's like a acrylic on wood, actually. I actually made that canvas, went to Home Depot, got like a wood panel uh -huh. and then like put a frame around it, drilled everything, assembled it together, put like this backboard behind it and then primed it and then started painting on wood. And so that it's just going back to the colors and that style that I was known for. And um, the thing with acrylic is sometimes like the colors, you can kind of see actually, the colors almost feel a little more rich and dynamic compared to the digital stuff in ways. I've hear, heard people say that. So it's something that I love to do, but um, I just haven't had the time it's I was going to say, it's probably a lot, a lot more time consuming. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's crazy. You know, like sometimes the digital art stuff you can pump out, you know, within a week or so. And this stuff, you just crank away and like, it takes, it takes time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something that I think it's a good, you're kind of flexing a different part of your brain mm -hmm. and working that different creative, especially it's kind of backbreaking <laughs> compared to just being on a computer. But yeah, it's it's fun. It's something that I've considered, you know, because there's the element of NFTs being physical, mm -hmm. including into the NFT space. So it's definitely something I would love to jump back into if I can yeah. find the time. <laughs> yeah, true. So are those um, are those now artworks that you will hold personally as inspiration throughout? Um, what what what's the future of all of these? Uh, yeah, I think right now it's just holding i'm holding on to these because it, it can maybe kind of be a reminder mm -hmm. and an inspiration and a reminder where i came from where i started um but you know sometimes you gotta let the babies go so eventually i think i can i can see them going somewhere in the future mm -hmm. but for now they're gonna stay safe with me stay at home yeah <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah <laughs> Then how about how about the other side of the room? There are uh, two two smaller one up on the other side of the TV and then one on the floor. Um, the one up on the on the hanging up that's by an artist, a Taiwanese artist, uh, Bang Sang B A N G dot S A N G. You mm -hmm. can find him. I don't think he's on Twitter, but he's on Instagram. Amazing artist. Like I, I absolutely. That's actually not mine, but we definitely were drawn inspiration from the same sources. And I know we've been following each other for years now on Instagram, but yeah, great, great artists out there. A lot of this stuff is stuff I got from, um, what is it? Uh, Takashi, Takashi oh. print back there that I got. He had a huge installation in Dallas, Texas, right before COVID. And he had Takashi Palm. Um, and I got one of his prints and some memorabilia. And there's some stuff wrapped back there. That's acrylic paintings of mine that just kind of stored and collecting dust. So some of these paintings I have are like, it's kind of collecting dust and just sitting there waiting, you know, to do something with. So I think I'll eventually figure it out. Amazing. Amazing. I always, I always love to see what's around both what someone has created, what someone's drawing inspiration from. I'm always fascinated by, uh, I don't know, just the wall, the, the walls around us and what we put on them. I mean, you got, what is that, Trevor Jones and yep. and you got Philip Hodas. Yep. And then I, the astronaut looks so familiar, but I'm not sure who that one is. So it's KPSD. He's oh. done predominantly all his work uh, on Maker's Place. I think he did briefly Rarible, but but Maker's Place. Um, and I think I just saw him post, uh, he was away for a little bit, but he just posted something new. So um, that, and that the story behind that was, I embarked upon something and I've repeated a few times since probably time for a new one, but um, I just, I like to go on a site every now and again and remove all expectations. Like I, I uh, try to try not to look at, at names or, or anything. 
yeah. and just scroll through the, you know, these general pages, uh, like Maker's Place is great for that because you can just go and browse and browse and browse. Um, and my goal was to just find something that I liked, just something that, that spoke to me in a different sort of way. Uh, and that, that was the first time I ever did that in the NFT space. Nice. That's a special one. It's definitely yeah, exactly. dear to the heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. It's just, if it resonates on you at a deep level and you, mm -hmm. you just, okay, I want that on my, my wall. And that's, that's the authentic, authentic, raw emotion reaction. And I think that's the beauty of art, you know? Exactly. And then, um, see that shoe that's tommy wilson oh, yeah. got to give the shout out over there yeah yeah tommy's <laughs> awesome dude super nice guy super friendly i've chatted with him just a couple of times on online but yeah it's really awesome seeing different walks of life mm -hmm. seeing people with different careers all of a mm -hmm. sudden they're like i want to make art it's yep. really it's it's, it's amazing Yep. And I think that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. And you used the phrase earlier, but melting pot ends up being a melting pot for so many, so many incredible people exploring new territory. Um, yeah. But then as always, to pull it back to you, because this is, this is your show today, uh, I want to get back to your NFT journey. So you took us through, uh, you took us through your Genesis. Um, you showed us obviously behind you Whammy, which is tied to Super Rare, which is also an NFT but go anywhere beyond that. So obviously plenty, plenty more on Super Rare. I'd love to get to the collaborations with Dave Krugman, I'm a huge Dave Krugman fan as well. And then over on Nifty Gateway, obviously now you have two collections over there. So take us where you'd like on your NFT journey. Yeah, uh, Dave Krugman and I, uh, we linked up a couple of times. We've been following each other on social media like for quite a while now, maybe mm -hmm. since 2016. I've always been a fan of photography growing up and anything filmography, obviously. So I was really always drawn to his work, his um, very atmospheric, a lot of nighttime shots in New York that kind of made me think of Blade Runner and very sci-fi-esque. So I think I, we kind of knew that we, we drew inspiration from the same source. Mm -hmm. So we got talking on social media like a couple years ago. And then right before like COVID hit, we did a collaboration just for fun where it was like this uh, moving pan shot blurred out like Tokyo. And then I put like this illustrative girl, like on this like cyberpunk motorbike flying through the street. And it was just like the funnest thing to just like work with the guy. And like, we just jived and we just had the, the most like creative open fun. And we were able to kind of draw things out of us that like in challenge us in ways and come up with ideas that it just flowed right. It just, felt right so i think sometime in january like we started talking about it he showed a lot of interest and everything with all ships was really awesome when he was doing there and talking with uh, nft artists and i could just see his conviction and his like he just was so invested into it and it was really awesome and contagious so talking with them and getting us each other hyped up on this collaboration and he just sent me some footage over. We went through some footage and then it was this one piece that like his, his it was like of um, an old building in New York City that's like pretty historic. And it's like in a pretty rare location where he shot it. I think it's like right below where Jeff Bezos apartment is. And it's just, it had this like really impactful kind of composition. I'm like, dude, we should just build like a cyberpunk cityscape over it and put like, you know, little nods to like Bitcoin and crypto and like the future of crypto and the history of crypto and all this stuff and just sprinkle all these things on it and have fun with it. And let's make an NFT out of it. And we just kind of ran with it and played with these ideas and I've done a couple of collaborations. And so we have two pieces of these uh, sector one being of New York. And then we have sector two of uh, Venice uh, up on Super Air. So those are, have been amazing, fun collaborations. And I've been a big advocate and I'm really happy he's on Super Air now. So shout out to Dave. And he's got a couple pieces of his own now. So it's really great seeing him there. Agree. That, that's a collaboration that makes me happy. Just like purely, purely happy. Um, we had talked about Dave very briefly, but before I really knew Dave, and then I've since had a chance to both talk to Dave, work with Dave, like all, all of the above. And then, um, yeah, just seeing the two of you have these works out there and have such a positive, strong connection. Incredible, incredible people, incredible artists. Yeah. Yeah. It's really great. Um, and then 
around the same time, uh, we did, uh, my wife, cause my wife helps me with some of these artworks. She sometimes comes up with ideas or, or, uh, kind of in a way art directs and okay, maybe you should, you know, position the camera like this. And mm -hmm. she was really involved with my first collection, the beauty standards on uh, nifty gateway, where it's like these cyberpunk pinup girls. So yeah. Right. Right after, right after my birthday, January 28th. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Happy super belated birthday. Thanks, so. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We did the drop on nifty gateway and like, that was fun, man. Like that was a lot of fun just being able to work with my wife on a fun collection it was her idea that it should be like these empowering women that almost feel mm -hmm. like an unattainable and I thought this would be perfect just kind of a test run see how nifty does because it's a completely different beast than super rare so really fun to be able to work on that and then you know just keep pushing himself and and then we did another drop like about a month ago and mm -hmm. different theme different style because that's like something with like people will see like I, I play around with different themes and different styles like you know the Dave Krugman drop was completely different than mm -hmm. like what my style is known for and it's more about like the, the whole visual facts and still bring in those pops of colors but I like to be able to kind of explore and try different things so it's all about that. And you had a really significant charity connection, right? To your last yeah. drop on Nifty Gateway. So uh, Brown Art Inc., Crypto Kids Camp, Save the Children. Yeah. Talk, talk about your, your, your choice there in general to do that and, and to have that aspect. Well, yeah, it was in ways to kind of to celebrate the month of Juneteenth and to, mm -hmm. to kind of give back to other community of artists or other sectors that are in a way can be kind of connected to crypto like the crypto kids camp but maybe be a bigger picture because you know sometimes you want to kind of you get really involved in nft space you kind of want to zoom out and see the mm -hmm. big picture and see where you know artists that you would definitely want to support and believe in like the brown art ink is great it's, it's all like a women of you know like brown and black and different backgrounds and it's based like I think in like New York City so being able to kind of shine light and give flowers to those artists and because different walks of life art is a reflection of culture and it has something to say so I think all voices need to be heard in mm -hmm. this space so being able to kind of shine that light and contribute to that as well and then you know doing something on a broad scale like save the children so yeah, it's just kind of, that was in a way, my own way of trying to give back to like, you know, communities mm -hmm. and in different sectors. So, yeah. And good on you. I mean, I, I look across Exulo and it just feels, uh, I, I don't want to say too structured. That's the wrong, that's the wrong terminology, but it, it feels just like nicely just nicely organized like you know you can scroll through um a, a pretty cohesive super rare account see the progression see the collabs with with dave krugman and then jump over and see um two collections one you know one just i mean you described it already but beauty standards you know just this you look from figure to figure to figure and it's so clearly part of the same thing and then the other collection to me was connected mostly by by color right your your amazing amazing colors and then having several different pieces yeah yeah uh that was playing a lot on like color theory and being able to have because it was you know it went from spring summer fall winter and being able to kind of reflect uh and use color as like a storyteller and a theme mm -hmm. for each and feel kind of separate but almost kind of way feel connected because through the seasons and it's really great seeing people really resonate with like the winter piece with the girl like on the the horse yes yeah referencing like game of thrones like it was one of those pieces that just like it comes out of nowhere it feels right and it was really great seeing people resonate with it and appreciate it and i don't care you can hold it you can sell you can do whatever the hell you want with it so <laughs> <laughs> i love it man want to play a game yeah let's go time for a lightning round so the, the drill is quick takes, a couple words, a sentence, couple sentences. And if I say anything that, that sets you off in a direction, feel free to just tell me pause and, and go tackle it. All right. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Here we go. Topic number one. First thing that comes to mind, NFTs. Uh, evolution. 
Ethereum. One of the future of cryptocurrency. One word. I have to say one word. No, no, no. You, uh, be, the, be one little... one aspect of the future of currency. Because I don't want to like bash <laughs> on Bitcoin. It's not. It's one of the elements of the future of currencies. Color. Um. Happy. Dave Krugman. Beautiful soul. Victor Mascara. Another beautiful soul. <laughs> Another beautiful soul. <laughs> Super rare. Uh, scarcity. Nifty Gateway. Collectors. The last chronologically, so no ranking list, better than someone's better than someone else, but the last piece chronologically of artwork in the NFT space that made your jaw drop. Ah, man, it was actually one of the pieces I clicked on Super Rare. I have to like check it out. Yeah. It is in my collection on Super Rare. Uh, Ignatius Arts and constantly thinking about tomorrow. Um, I think, honestly, it's like the, it goes back to the juxtaposition of colors and reflecting. It just kind of like pulls a certain emotion out of me. It's happy, but it's like, it, it's that whole happy, but kind of sad feeling that I get from it. And it's that feeling that you're always having to think and maybe worry what's ahead and anxiety that it can create. Mm -hmm. But then there's this like rich, beautiful, like orange that's surrounding this beautiful, rich clouds and like flowers. So it's that yin and yang, that balance. I think that one, I just, I still look back on it and just kind of, I think I get the same kind of feeling that it's, just, it's a good feeling, but it's realistic mm -hmm. about the world around us. So it's real raw feeling from it. Check it out and we'll, uh, we'll pop a link into the Twitter show notes on that one. Yeah, definitely. Similar question, but pulling someone or something different. Chronologically, the last artist or artwork you took a look at and you said, why have more people not seen this? Why are there not more eyeballs on this? God, I feel like there's... Uh, yeah, like Maggie West. Maggie West uh, is a photographer uh, that I've been following for quite some time on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's two people like two photographers that, that come to mind, but it's definitely uh, Maggie West. Um, you can follow her on Instagram, but she makes these really rich, vivid photographs kind of feel of play on colors. But I've always sat there and like scratched my head and why, why aren't people paying more attention to her? So definitely check her out. Let's go a few words on our most recent guest on Origin Stories, Baca Arts. Baca, yeah, dude. I like what he does. I think we we jive in the same realm of of being able to do things that are like between illustrative and 3D. And it's mm -hmm. really fun watching each other and other people kind of push that technology. So keep doing what he's doing. Love it. And then how about to flip it? A future guest of or on origin stories. Who should it be, Exula? Who should it be? Because you already did Lodge Sacks, huh? I did. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's take it on Dave Krugman. Bring Dave Krugman on there. It's a good one. It has to happen. All right, yeah. Dave. We're coming for you. <laughs> yeah. Watch out, Dave. Let's do it. Yeah. Dave Krugman. Nice. And then to break it out of the lightning round, feel free to go on Go on, on this one. But what is next for Exula? Uh, playing with ideas with VR and then also physical statues, 3D printed physical items to connect it with an actual nft so little r d there but that's kind of like a little bit of insight of where it's going to go and um cool shit happening with super rare collection in mm -hmm. october it, it's going to be like something really awesome keep an eye on that some All physical right. screens as well as the good old digital nft stuff so and then oh yeah uh maker's place august 3rd Got a Other. new drop going. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there, yeah. Can't forget that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally sidetracked on that one. August 3rd, Maker's Place. There's going to be, 
I don't want to give out too much because they're like, oh, don't tell any anyone anything yet. But three pieces, Maker's yeah. Place coming up. Can't wait, man. Made my own music and to go with artwork. So Ooh. yeah, tinkered around with some audio. I so we got audio. Yeah. We have various forms of possible physicals in the future. A lot of, uh, we have VR exploration coming, right? So mm -hmm. this is Exulo branching out. Yeah, so try not to spread myself out too thin, but yeah, yeah. exploring and branching, exactly that. Fantastic, man. Um, cool. I appreciate you both as an artist and a human being. Uh, always been someone who, anytime I hear you speak, and or right, even just just gleaning your your personality, your approach from everything you do on Twitter and beyond. Um, just all, someone who has always struck me as um, I would say as a very positive human being. But to use your language, not too positive, right? Always in uh, in perspective, supportive, but in perspective. Um, I, I love love what you're doing in general. Ditto. Same thing, man. Uh, yeah, I appreciate everything that you're doing. All the artists that you bring together and your conviction and your dedication in this space so much love to you man thanks man and hey gotcha. we'll, well i feel like we'll be here again we'll be it's oh, just yeah. a, it's just a matter of time origin stories becomes milestone stories down the road exactly to the future of origin stories i'm excited for all the future guests that you guys bring on so i'll definitely keep an eye out on that too man thank you thank you for spending the time thank you Ixulo. thank you to your wife for being so awesome and being yes. a, such a huge part of the picture as well Absolutely. All right, man. We'll talk to you cool. soon. Cool.